Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Let's go ahead and just thank the Lord that we're all here in the house safely today. It's not our full congregation, but this is like our second week of our little soft launch open back to society and back to the world, back to synagogue, back to Shabbat. We've been actually digital every week, but we have been following the, the lifted restrictions from our city and our area and uh, speaking with Andrew, uh, uh, the mayor, Andrew Kodiak. Uh, he let me know weeks ago that we were able to meet as long as we're responsible adults. So guess what? We are obeying the law. At the same time, we're also obeying God's law. Amen? To not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and to treat this as a holy convocation to the Lord. So come on, give the Lord another hand clap that many of you are back with us today. And so good to have so many smiling faces. Let's also welcome our online audience that's watching and has been watching every week. Shabbat Shalom, and we say Brahim Habaim to all of our first-time guests in the house. And we had some first-timers that were with us for Hebrew class and our Torah, Torah service. And we are continuing a series called Tribe Wars, Tribe Wars. And the first week of this series, I asked the question, what's the battle all about? Then last week, we looked at what is Shavuot all about. This week, because we deal with the menorah, I'm going to ask the question, what is the menorah all about? Yeah. This reading comes from Bemidbar Numbers 8, 1 through 12, 16. Uh, the prophet reading is Zechariah or Zechariah 2, 10, or in some versions, verse 14 through 4, 7. And 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 13 is what we read this morning. So if we jump right into Numbers 8, 1 in the complete Jewish Bible, I'm going to start with. Adonai said to Moshe, tell Aharon, Moshe being Moses, Aharon being Aaron. Tell Aharon, when you set up, in Hebrew, Bechalotacha, the lamps. That's the name of the portion. Bechalotacha, which means to set up in this translation, the lamp. The seven lamps are to cast their light forward in front of the menorah. Notice to cast light, just like you and I should cast light. Aharon did this, he, he, its lamps, so as to give light in front of the menorah. Notice that. He is lighting the lamps to give light in front of the menorah as Adonai had ordered Moshe. Here is how the menorah was made. It was hammered gold from its base to its flowers, hammered work, following the pattern Adonai had shown Moshe. This is how he made the menorah. Remember, this is a part of the heavenly pattern that God showed Moshe in the mount. When God says you to make everything according to the pattern. So the purpose of the menorah is to cast light or we can say to illuminate in front of the menorah. So wherever the menorah is, it's meant to cast light and to illuminate. You and I are to cast light and we are to help illuminate the eyes of those that are in darkness, those that have no knowledge or are living in darkness in this world. And so that is a, one of the things set forth in this portion for the menorah. But if you go back to the original construction of the menorah, menorah found in the book of Shemot or Exodus 25:31. It says, you are to make a menorah of pure gold, pure gold, by a hammered work. Its base, stems, cups, bulbs, flowers are to be one piece. Imagine how difficult that would be for an artisan to make this of one piece of gold. There are to be six branches coming out of the sides, three branches of the menorah out of one side and three branches on the other side. Verse 37, you are to also make the seven lamps for it and set the lamps up to shed light over the space before it. Once again, we have cast light, illuminate, now shed light. Imagine how God was speaking to Israel that I want you to cast light, I want you to illuminate, and I want you to shine light or to literally in this passage, it says to shed light all over the space. Wherever, wherever the menorah is placed, it is to shine light. And last week we looked at Psalm 67 that is used for Shavuot and it's written as a menorah and it's called the menorah psalm, the menorah psalm. And I want to take one little excerpt out of this beautiful menorah that you see is still out of one piece of gold with steps on it. It has steps here you can see. And these steps are actually interesting because they really are near certain steps in Jerusalem when it comes to the Temple Mount area. You actually go to Israel today and still see this menorah steps away from the Temple Mount area or the Kotel, the retaining wall of the temple. 
So I want to draw something that I shared last week, but it will apply for this week. It says the menorah has seven lambs. How many lambs? Seven. These seven lambs of the menorah are a picture of the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit listed in Isaiah 11, 2 and Revelation 4, 5. But notice the three couplets there, but the spirit of the Lord, speaking of Messiah's lordship, would be the center. So we see that there are seven lamps in the Torah mentioned for the menorah, and now there are seven lamps that are the seven spirits of God that are first mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Are you following? Okay, this, some of it is just review. But I want to focus on one of the seven spirits, because we know after the spirit of the Lord, we have the spirit of wisdom. Did you know that it's said of Joshua that the spirit of wisdom came upon him? This is just like all the artisans that made the menorah, that made the tabernacle furniture. They had to have the spirit of wisdom come upon them. It must have been the spirit of God operating as the spirit of wisdom. How many need the spirit of wisdom to give you wisdom, to give you revelation? Now, it was said of J Joseph, just like it was said of Daniel. Look what it says of Daniel. There was a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom. Did you catch that? Light and understanding and wisdom. I'm going to say that again. Light and understanding and wisdom. He says, it's like the wisdom of the gods, they said. I mean, because remember, they had to have different gods. One God of light, one God of wisdom, one God of understanding. And they had to say, their God is like all of our gods in one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And this is very important, uh, that you actually see the menorah as a symbol of the sevenfold ministry of the spiritual illumination. And I want to piggyback on that with the writings of Rav Shaul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He says, but as it is written, no eye has seen nor ear heard, notice the function, and no mind has imagined, or the heart in some versions, has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10 says, but God has revealed. What has God done? He's revealed to anyone who can understand his own thoughts except his own inner spirit. In the same way, no one can know the thoughts of God except God's spirit. You want to know the thoughts of God, which are higher than your thoughts? You need the spirit of God. If you want to know the ways of God, which are higher than your ways, you need the spirit of God because the spirit of God will lead you in the way of truth. He will lead you into all truth. Uh, verse 12 actually says, Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from who? God. So notice that the spirit comes from God. As the Messiah came from God, but God is God. So I tend to not like to fall into the trap of the Trinitarian definition of God because of its confusion among the Jewish people, and I'm called to the Jewish people. So right. that's important to me because if I'm going to be led by the Spirit, I don't get caught up in things that are going to be confusing to the people I'm called to. Go back to the latter part here, verse 13. We don't speak about these things with words taught us by human wisdom, but the words taught by the Spirit as we explain spiritual things to spiritual people. So this psalm is actually a reflection of Bechalotacha, this week's Torah portion. He says Numbers 11 is where they d started to crave this greed or have deep cravings for this food beyond what God's provision was. It says, and they tested God. What did they do? They tested God there in desolate places. And then he recounts Exodus 17, 7, uh, this uh, expanded Bible. Verse 15 says, so he gave them what they wanted or asked for. But he also sent a terrible disease or a wasting sickness. We need leaders to listen to the spirit of the living God. If you're watching out there, if you're the leader of your home or a leader of a business or a leader of, of a, a state or a nation or a kingdom of this world, listen to the spirit of God speak. He's speaking right now. And I'm prophetically speaking. He is speaking to leaders and some are not listening but they're having secret councils behind closed doors and thinking about how they can plot and plan and scheme. That is what the enemy does. He plans and plots and schemes against the people of God. 
but his weapons won't work. Amen? So look at Acts 7.51. It also recounts Israel in the Messianic days of the book of Acts. They were actually following the Messiah's lead to go in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But there were men of Israel, Jewish people, that would not listen to the message and resisted the apostles and the anointing that was on them like Israel in the wilderness resisted Moses. And I asked the question in the midst of a tribal war amongst the Israelites in the wilderness and actually defining what tribal distinctions are. One of the biggest questions today is, well, what, what's the big deal about being Jewish? I had a man uh, on a, a little vacation getaway, you know, just a few weeks ago I went to Carlsbad, and I had a man tell me, well, you know, the Jews are done with. <laughs> I was like, you don't tell a Sicilian Jewish rabbi, a Messianic Jew, that his Jewish people are done. I said, show me chapter and verse. The Jews are not done. <laughs> Has he? Has he rejected his people? He throws the question out. May it never be, or literally, may it never be said. For I too am an Israelite. What does Paul call himself? An Israelite. Of the seed of who? Abraham. Meaning a descendant of Abraham. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Now this is important because you see the distinction. Look what it says. As Shaul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, is it all right if I say something to you? And the commander said, you know Greek? You, in other words, this is the statement he's saying, you know Greek. He says, say, aren't you that Egyptian who tried to start a revolution a while back and led 4,000 army terrorists out into the desert? In other words, a Jew that knows Hebrew? That was scholarly. For you to know Hebrew, you're part of synagogue life, temple life, and you even say, I have something more than this. You have someone trained as a Pharisee. So he had a perfect command of the language of Hebrew. I was a zealot for God, as all of you are today. So that means he's zealous for the Torah. And I persecuted to death the followers of this way. In other words, the very people that I'm associated with now, I was persecuting them followers of the way. Notice that was a term before they were even considered messianic or followers of Messiah. They were followers of the way. That was a secret way to define themselves without causing an uprising or persecution. Arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. Now, what I need to do is take you back to a couple slides of a teaching I did for Bible college on Galatians. And this is a really fun class I did. I should probably do it again here at the synagogue. And we will travel through the liberating teachings of Rabbi Gamaliel, or Gamaliel, uh, Rabbi Gamaliel's prized student as he communicates the heavenly message of the gospel or good news to both Jews and especially Gentiles or non-Jews living in the infamous city of Galatia. Then I said that we would ask age-old questions that the Apostle Paul attempted to address and it will be revisited in this study to recapture the original audience and message that he desired to illuminate. Desire to what? Illuminate. Now, this is what I taught back then, but it just happens to go so perfectly with the illumination of the menorah and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. He says, it will illuminate say, and liberate us uh, as true believers in the Messiah. So the questions I asked in this teaching was, were, are we under the law? Can Gentiles become Jews, quote-unquote, meaning through a official conversion? Should they be circumcised, question mark? Is the Torah null and void? And does the new covenant replace the old? So I asked the question, Miha Sofer. <laughs> Miha Sofer means who's the author? The author of Galatians is Saul of Tarsus, who is the prized student of Rabbi Gamaliel, and as Paul, which is Greek for small, was called to reach the Gentile nations and Israel with the good news of Yeshua and the Messiah. So he says, I am a Jew. What does that mean? Being a Jew does not mean he's from the tribe of Judah, but from the territory of Judah. That means he grew up in the territory of Judea. Remember, the gospel goes to Jerusalem, Judea, area, and then to the other most parts. He's saying basically, because I grew up learning at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, I'm a Judean. I am a Jew, and I live in, among my Jewish people in Judah because the word Jew comes from Judah. 
So that's what he means by he's a Jew. And the reason we know that is because of other things he said. Look what it means when he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. That means I'm a son of a descendant of Ab Abraham. So by calling himself a Hebrew, Abraham is the first person called a Hebrew. From Eber, a descendant of Noah. So basically you have a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning I come from a long line of Hebrews, but my lineage goes all the way back to the seed of Abraham. It says, I speak the truth, Paul says, as one who belongs to Messiah. Now he says, I belong to Messiah. He goes, I don't lie. And also is bearing witness is my conscience governed by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. My conscience is being governed by the Holy Spirit. They were given the adoption of sonship. They were given the Shekinah glory. They were given the covenants. They were given the law or the Torah. They were given the temple service of worship. They were given the promises. They were given the patriarchs. And they were given the promised Messiah. Eight blessings that Israel was given. Yet, sadly enough, the last one, Israel is still blind to. Let's go now to the book of Luke, or in Greek, Lucas. Luke 2.25, and look at this righteous man by the name of Simeon, or Shimon. It says, there was in Yerushalayim, which is Jerusalem, a man named Shimon. This man was a Sadiq, which means a righteous man. He was devout, and he was eagerly waiting for God to comfort Israel. And the Ruach HaKodesh was upon him, or the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Ruach HaKodesh or by the Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Messiah of Adonai. Prompted now by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts and when the parents brought in the child Yeshua to do for him what the Torah required, verse 28 says, Shimon took him in his arms, made a bracha or a blessing to God and said, now, Adonai, according to your word, your servant is at peace as you let him go. For I have seen with my own eyes your Yeshua, which means in Hebrew, salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light that will bring revelation to the Goyim, which are the Gentile nations, and glory to your people Israel. Jumping down to verse 52, it says, And Yeshua grew both in wisdom and in stature, gaining favor both with other people and with God. In other words, Jesus as a young child had to grow physically and spiritually in the spirit of wisdom. And so when we look at just two chapters later, Luke 4, 14, now an adult male, and he's turning age 30. And it says, Yeshua returned to the Galil, which is the Galilee, in the power of the Spirit. And reports about him spread throughout the countryside. He'd just been baptized or immersed in water. He taught in their synagogues, meaning he was a rabbi. And everyone respected him. Notice that everyone respected him. Now, when he went to Nazareth or Nazareth, where he had been brought up, on Shabbat, he went to the synagogue as usual, or some versions say, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and he was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshayahu, which is the prophet Isaiah, and his name means salvation is of the Lord. Unscrolling the scroll, or literally unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, therefore he has anointed me. Now we know this is Isaiah 61.1 because it's the last prophet reading of the year before the Jewish New Year begins for Yeshua to start a new Jewish ministry in a new Jewish year. The Feast of Trumpets would have been the beginning of this season. So now, as we look at the fact that Yeshua as a child all the way to adulthood needed the Holy Spirit, just like Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, needed the Holy Spirit as a Jew to have the scales come off of his eyes. It's the same way all Jewish people, the nation of Israel, must have the spiritual scales come off their eyes and must have spiritual growth by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the Holy Spirit, for them to receive the Messiah. And this is found in a prophecy in the prophet Zechariah, or the prophet Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 7. It says, The Lord 
will save the tents of Judah first. Notice the tribe of Judah is mentioned. So that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, King David, meaning powerful. And the house of David should be like God, because God in Hebrew, Elohim, or El, means to be strong, like the angel of the Lord before them. And we know that Michael, the archangel, is the strong angel that defends Israel, sp spoken of in Daniel chapter 12. And so verse 9 says, It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Again, this is probably the battle of Armageddon. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look upon me, the Father says, whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In other words, Yeshua is the firstborn of the Father, but now all of Israel will see his death as if it was their firstborn son that had died. Now we look at verse 11. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. Now remember we mentioned the Battle of Armageddon? Well, Megiddo is the Hebrew word for Armageddon. Armageddon is actually the Aramaic form into Greek coming from Har, meaning mountain, and Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. Har Megiddo becomes Armageddon when the H is dropped as it goes into Greek. And so you look at verse 12, it says, the land shall mourn, notice the land, every family by itself, the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the house of Nathan by itself, and the their wives by themselves. And look at another tribe, the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves. And it continues to go on, referencing that all the tribes will mourn, the tribes of the land. Now we know exactly why Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 speaks this way concerning the coming of the Messiah. It says, look, he is coming, speaking of Yeshua, with clouds, Referencing Daniel 7.13, the Son of Man will come with clouds of heaven. Quoted by Yeshua himself in Matthew 24.30. Talking about the Son of Man coming in great dominion and power with the clouds of heaven. And it says all the tribes of the earth, or it should say all the tribes of the land, the land of Israel, shall mourn because of him. Yes, amen. Because remember, Yeshua is coming back to Israel. He's coming back to Jerusalem. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. So this has to be a reference John is making to the land of Israel and the tribes of the land of Israel. So now that we know how important it is for Israel to not just live in a state of fighting and frustration as tribes that are having tribe wars, we know that there's a unity spoken of in the menorah, this mystery of the menorah as a symbol of the Spirit's ministry and the Spirit's illumination. We also found out that rejecting the Holy Spirit is to be stiff-necked in spiritual rebellion. And now for my third and final point, that the tribes of Israel will be able one day to see the Messiah by the Ruach through a spiritual revelation. In other words, they have to spiritually open their eyes to the Messiah before they can physically see the Messiah in his return. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the end of days. And so this message today, really speaking of what is the menorah all about? It's about the unity that brings the Jewish people together, stops the rebellion, stops the resisting of the Holy Spirit, and allows the Spirit of God to reveal and open their eyes to the revelation of the coming Messiah. That's what the final book of the Bible is all about. The revelation that Yeshua is the Messiah. Amen and amen. Should you set your hands for the blessing? Ve'asim lecha 
Shalom. Amen. May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May he shine his face upon you, be gracious to you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace in Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. In Yeshua the Messiah, we pray. Bishim Yeshua.